Hey everybody, welcome to this very special bonus holiday episode of BGA straight from our Patreon collection. This is the first of our retrospective series where we look back at our early, early episodes and all the games we played when we first launched this podcast. This is episodes one through four. I hope you enjoy. I hope you have fun with this. We've been doing a bunch of them. I think we're up through about 30 or so episodes. So if you do like this and you want to hear more, you can join us on patreon.com slash BGA and backing us at any level will get you access to all of these bonus episodes. So thank you again. We hope you have happy holidays, happy new year, and just have fun with the episode. All right. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, special episode number 11, episode recap number one through number four. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you this special episode. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together with our Patreon backers. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. Anthony, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there was a podcast and turns out that that was us. And that was a long time ago. And here we are going back to the beginning to take a look at, to take a listen to, and to, I guess, review our reviews of games that we looked at from our episode one through four. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy to look back. I mean, this is almost six years ago at this point. Some of these games were played six years ago in anticipation of that podcast that we launched that summer. It's funny going back through the list and being like, what game is that? I don't know if I've played that since then. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of these games are still classics. Some of these games have been literally burned in some cases or punted a far, far away. So we wanted to take a look back at our episodes and let you know, like we do with every episode, if the game's a buy, a play, a dodge, or a dreaded burn, and and how has those games fared over those many, many years. So for these arc of Patreon back episodes, we're going to take a look back at all of our episodes and hopefully you'll join us on this journey as we kind of get a little nostalgic and maybe in some cases talk about these games that we've actually recently got played. So first off, we're going to be talking about episode one. This is way, way back in 2013. And the feature review, which we don't do feature reviews any longer, at least as far as a single game is concerned. But the feature review for that episode was Lords of Waterdeep its expansion, The Scoundrels of Skullport. And this was a base game that had gotten a lot of game time at our table. And in fact, the expansion really brought some new stuff to gaming situation. Yeah, yeah. And it's a funny game because uh, Lords of Waterdeep by itself is a great gateway worker placement game, very basic. But Scoundrels of Skullport adds so much depth and cool new stuff and different ways to play it. I still say that. <laughs> like when people ask me about, you know, oh, is this worth getting or what's the best, you know, worker placement game to pick up if it's your first one or if you're trying to get D&D people into it, whatever the trigger is for me to recommend Lords of Waterdeep, there's always the addendum of, but make sure you also get Scoundrels of Skullport because it really makes the game great. Yeah, this was a game for me that I enjoyed when we first got the game out, but it was just an okay game. And the Sculptrons of Skullport is an essential must-have for the game. I really never, ever want to play this game without the expansion. I do still see it being played at game night, so I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. It's a little life for my taste, but oh, you have the expansion? Mm, okay, if there's nothing else to play, I'll still play it. So probably the game with the expansion was a buy for me. It probably you know, boils down a little bit to a play. I own the base set. I haven't been able to pick up the expansion at a sales price yet. I do intend to do so just because I want to have this game part of my collection. But for me, 
it's definitely a strong play and then maybe a light buy for me. Yeah, I think I'm probably in the same boat. Like I already own it. I own both the things, um, even have an insert for this thing. Wow. But it doesn't really hit the table all that much anymore just because there are so many worker placement games, especially in that like lightweight mid gateway ish level. This is still one that I recommend for a lot of people, but there's a lot of them that I would now recommend. And so you kind of cycle through those. But yeah, it's still a strong play and I'm keeping my copy after many purges. It's still on my shelf. So <laughs> it's a strong uh, endorsement if there ever was one. Nice. Well, Anthony, we had some at the table. So games that we actually got a chance to play. Uh, first up was Garden Dice. Now, Garden Dice was this really interesting dice rolling game where you were growing plants and you were trying to water them and you had different little kind of bonuses that kind of help you grow the plants. I enjoyed this game at the time and I actually picked up a copy and I believe there's an expansion that came along with this game or at least now currently comes along with this game or you could pick it up separately. I think it was just a deck of cards. I own this game. Uh, It's fun. It's definitely on the lighter side. I really enjoy the artwork though and it's still part of my collection. How about you? I never picked it up. I think I just played it the one time and I actually remember because uh, my wife played with us and she fell asleep while we were playing. So wow. It was, <laughs> it was late and she was tired and we had a, uh, as of then, a two-year-old. So it was, uh, that's my only real memory of this game and I just have never gone back to it. So I have nothing to offer here other than my wife falls asleep in just about any situation. Well, Margaret gives the game two Z's down. So yeah. <laughs> not a strong endorsement of the game. I haven't played it in quite some time. I do own a copy of it. I think at some point it might get some table time. So maybe it'll get some table time as long as it's not with Margaret. I think we'll be okay. All right. Another game that we talked about was a classic deception game, role selection game here, Anthony. This is uh, Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, man, this game is so cool. I mean, I don't think I've played it since the days of Myriad because that was a place where it came out a lot, but I always enjoyed it. Well, I'm not going to say I always enjoyed it. There was a couple times I didn't enjoy it, but in theory, I feel like I would always enjoy it, all things being perfect with the right group of people. (laughs) So uh, my big issues with the game and the reason it doesn't hit the table anymore is it's just too dang long and now it's almost impossible to find. I picked up a copy, I believe it was at GameStop when they had this their big sale for Battlestar Glad, and they were just dumping these copies out in the market. I remember liking the game a lot. I think, Anthony, you and I had a kind of like interesting kind of memorable time where our friend Vinny, I f- saw him switch out some cards that he was going to play and then pulled them back when he saw what somebody else was doing. And I said, Anthony, he's a Cylon. He's switching cards. Shoot him. And you had, I think it was Callie, who had the special ability to kill somebody in the game. She was the only character who had that ability. And you were like, what, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, no, you got to shoot him. He's, he's the silent. I'm telling you. And you're like, I, I don't really don't know you that well to do that. And uh, it, t- it turned out Vinny was a Cylon. And I don't remember if we won or lost the game, but I remember specifically, you know, just telling you to shoot somebody, which seems wrong at the time, but it, it you, you know, he was a silent after all. So <laughs> I'm too nice for this game. That's my problem. Like, yeah. I don't know. This game had multiple expansions with upgrades for everything. I kind of regret not getting all of the expansions just because it brought in little miniatures for the ships and everything. I like this game, but I think like Anthony said, it does take a long time to play. And that was a little problematic. For me, if you do see this game, it's a solid, solid play, maybe on a light buy side if you are a BSG fan. If you're not a BSG fan, it's still a very solid hidden role game, and I would recommend it. Just have some time placed aside. All right, Anthony. So another game that we got a chance to play a little bit, we, there was some new decks available at the time for Summoner Wars from Plathead. Yeah, this was my favorite uh, like two-player skirmish game for a really long time. And then there was a very long period of time and I realized I hadn't played it at all in that period of time. And so I actually got rid of my copy because there are a lot of other I have so many two player games. Uh, I don't think they really support this anymore. They have their new crystal clans, like more kind of family friendly look and feel type of game, um, which I also like quite a bit. But I don't know. the, The core mechanics, it's still a brilliant game. It's not quite in my top 100, but it's pretty close. Um. Definitely worth checking out, but 
it's uh, like all games, especially when they stopped supporting it, it kind of petered out and fell off a little bit. Yeah, just like the other games here for me, I don't know why they're all in the kind of same situation. I liked the game a lot. I picked up a base copy once again when it was on heavy discount. I picked up one or two of the expansions. This was also something you could play on your phone or tablet. So that's where I was getting the majority of my plays for this. So for me, this game was, once again, a highly recommended play if you've never played the game before. And if you get on discount, it's definitely worth the buy. You could play two players, which is the ideal situation, but you could also play four players, which gets a little iffy, but it's doable as far as games are concerned. And finally, Anthony, we talked about a uh, brand new game at the time, uh, Boss Monster. Yeah. Yeah, this is a funny because this is like early on. I think I've been gaming for like six or seven months and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Look at this. Look at the eight bit thing that's going to be run into the ground in like six months. Um, I was obsessed with this game. I like ordered it off their website. I sleeved it. I was like, we all have to play. And I think I picked up the first two, maybe even three expansions. And I still really like Boss Monster. I play it with my son because it's, you know, pretty straightforward um, for him as long as he can read everything that's on the cards and I just it's funny for me to look back at how much I liked it at the time and how you know a broader understanding of the hobby has made it like oh that's a cute game definitely play it but not necessarily like must buy <laughs> <laughs> yeah same here I, I bought a copy of this game I think I kickstarted this game just because the 8-bit dungeon crawl thing was such a novel thing at the time. And as, I, as you mentioned, Anthony, until they did it with everything. And then you were like, oh, for the 50th time, another 8-bit game. But this was fun. It got a little iffy if you play with multiple people because a lot of the take that spells that would happen would be like, well, what triggers first? And that became a little bit of an issue. The app, which I think was another Kickstarter, was kind of brutal. It, it really didn't live up to the game, which was a pretty simple game. I think I got this the first expansion. There was multiple expansions, but I jumped off that 8-bit wagon at some point. So it's a play. Uh, I own a copy of it. I have not got it to the table forever, but uh, not, not a bad little game for what it is. So that was our first episode. Anthony, let's jump on to our second episode, and our feature review here was Crossmaster Arena. You remember this game? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a common theme here. Uh, obviously, early on, there was a lot of people on the podcast. We didn't all play every game, and there were certain games maybe I played once or twice and just promptly forgot about. This is one of them. At the time, it was very, like, at the time, this was probably one of the highest production levels that we had seen in a board game. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at it now and it's kind of quaint. But at the time, these fully painted, beautiful miniatures, three-dimensional pieces on the board, all this stuff. It was one of those early Kickstarter games. It was like, look at what you can do with crowdfunding. And so it was played a lot because people just like to look at it. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know that I ever fell in love with the mechanics. I, I just kind of, like, I'm not a guy who looks at aesthetics and, cares too much i mean it's still pretty to look at but it just never really caught my attention from that side of things even with the 2.0 edition which is out you know a few years ago and you know that one's sitting somewhere in my basement i think <laughs> still haven't really got a chance to play it so i don't know this is not a game that ever hit for me still not really interested in getting it back out um just a lot more flash than substance for me yeah i remember this was one of the as you mentioned one of the big kick stars i think it was like four hundred dollars because every part of this kind of three-dimensional MOBA kind of like team versus team situation went from like token to like cardboard upgrade to like all out like toy factor. And I think the toy factor really brought people along. And it was really the first time where you were like, oh, Kickstarter is going to be a thing now. This is this is honestly solidly a thing now where there was just so much of this stuff. And it was incredible at the table because, you know, back six years ago, there wasn't this quality of artwork, design and production in a board game. So that was kind of fun. 
at the time the game was a play, I did pick up a copy of the 2.0 version of it just because, once again, massive auction sale. And I was like, huh, this is fun. Maybe the family will play this. They have still not played it. And it's still kind of wrapped up. And if you get a chance, it's kind of fun for some giggles, but it might be something that you just might want to pass up all together here. So let's talk about something that is, I think is the almost the complete opposite of Crossmaster Arena as far as production is concerned. This is uh Niroshima Hex. Yes, this game's purely about mechanics, and you just get the little tiles with the dudes on them. But on the flip side, it's very good. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it's significantly better than Crossmaster Arena. I love Niroshima Hex. I don't actually own a copy of it, but I've played the app you know, a few hundred times. Sure. There's a new edition of this uh, with kind of a fantasy theme on it, Monolith Arena, that just came out from Portal Games that I'm kind of eyeballing as a possible pickup in this field just because I really do love the mechanics of this. Like, it's a small little arena. You take turns playing out these tiles. They all interact with each other in different ways. It's so much fun. And it's one of the few games, like, from really early on in the hobby. I played it early and was like, oh, this is great. And I'm still... I still really like it a lot and would definitely recommend picking it up. Yeah, I never really liked this post-apocalyptic kind of theme to the game. I remember playing this back in board game version. But since then, I've played this. I think at some point it was like, hey, you got an achievement. You've played 500 games of this. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I did not intend to play 500 games of this. But this was one of the first, I think it was a free app, if I remember correctly, that you could download on your phone and just, you know, you know, play out a game in a minute. And it was quick, it was a simple, it was fun, and it has a, a good number of expansions that you have to, I believe, pay for, but it was definitely something worth playing. So I would say, and I think I'm saying this for you too, Anthony, it's a solid, solid play, despite how it looks here. And if you are so interested, it's not, not a bad uh, game to pick up. All right, well, finally is a game that might be a little controversial here. This is uh, Chronicle. Do you remember this one, at least? Yeah, Burn It With Fire. There you go, buddy. There's the Anthony I know. God, I hate this game. (laughs) I still do. I actually had to play this not too long ago because someone brought it out. I don't remember why. Oh, my God. It was at a local game night that was like, oh, I got my small box of games. Oh, Chronicle. Here's an old one. Nobody's really heard it. It's by the guy who did Love Letter. And I was like, I don't know, guys. But it was just like the time of the night i didn't want to go home and the number of people and i was like maybe it was just bad situation or nope nope it's a bad game guys it's just a bad game i I don't like it there's just so many things that can make it so you don't do anything why would you want to play a game where you sit there for 20 minutes just not doing anything uh yeah let's go down that road again i wasn't that pained by it it was a dodge for me but i totally understand what you're going with this sage can i did an admirable job with this, but this is a trick-taking game where, as Anthony mentioned, you could just do nothing. Uh, a game that I burned and did not want to see ever at the table game was Gloom. Despite the fact that it had this really interesting plastic overlays for the game, but it was a really bad kind of take that kind of game where you're trying to kill off your own characters. So it really didn't deserve to ever be at my table again how about you yeah i didn't love it (laughs) it was like it made me feel weird and icky and i know that's some people a theme is whatever but at the same time mechanically it was really relying on people to get into the storytelling part of it Mm -hmm. to have any amount of fun and i did not and therefore i did not um this was a solid dodge for me too i just wasn't into this All right, well, our episode three, our feature review for that was Game of Thrones, the card game, the LCG from Fantasy Flight. This would be version one. So, Anthony, you were the one that was carrying the torch for this game, and we, I believe we played your copy a good number of times. Still any love for this game? I still love this game. I just haven't played it in a while. And it makes me sad because it's such a good game. Like, mechanically, there's just so many cool things going on here, and the way it everything flows and the the different ways that the different houses kind of represent their theme so well i even painted my little player pieces you know the selection pieces when you're playing with three or four players for the first edition and i kept them for the second edition even though you don't really use them just because 
I like them. And I, I don't know, I just invested a lot of energy and time and mental strength into this game. And when the second edition came out, I was there at Gen Con, I picked up a copy right away, I bought the first few packs, and it just wasn't getting played enough. So I, I kind of dropped off and stopped buying those. And it's still here somewhere in the house. I don't remember the last time I played it. But I'm fairly certain if I played it now, I would still absolutely love it. It's just such a good game. Yeah, I really enjoyed this game so much. I remember at the time, I was very, very concerned with spoilers for Game of Thrones. So I was oh, like, <laughs> I was like, Anthony, is, is this a spoiler? Is, is, is this a spoiler? Is that card a spoiler? Because it kind of looks like a spoiler. And a lot of the cards were honestly spoilers. But, yeah, you know, they weren't in context. So you were like, oh, guys with flaming swords. I guess that's going to be a thing at some point. But you didn't know really where that was going to pop up. But I really enjoyed this game, being able to pick a certain role, get a benefit from that. Picking different houses were a lot of fun. Anthony always took the Starks, which was kind of mean because I wanted to play the Starks. But nonetheless, <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed the game. I wish I picked up the second edition. But as you mentioned, it's a little hard to get to the table. LCGs really haven't had the buzz that they had in the past so i don't know i it's it's if i do ever have the opportunity to pick up game at least a second edition at some significant discount i would definitely pick it up just because i love the book i love the show and i really do love the game all individually separate so if you're not a game of thrones fan you're like hey i can pick this game up super cheap should i pick it up well, probably no, because you probably should let me know about it. I pick it up super cheap and I'll play it with you. <laughs> so I would say uh, for both of us, if you do have the time, if you do have the group, if you do have friends, I, I, I think this game is still a buy for us. All right. So a couple of other games that we were able to get to the table at the time. Uh, first off was another early, early, early Kickstarters, Guilds of Caldewan. Yeah, this is a brilliant little game. It was, you know, this kind of a, the idea of like kind of this idea of like where you put your guys out of them this board that you kind of create out of these cards so it's area control but you also get these different powers based on which cards you complete it was just this clever little game that had a lot of different unique ideas going for it and just nobody bought it and nobody <laughs> would play it and it just kept going away and yes. so this is like one of cool mini or nots before they were simon their first first forays into gaming like actually publishing games and it just i don't know it's gone now you can't find it anymore it's just a shame because it's a good mechanically tight little game i remember this being on kickstarter i guess probably after the fact because i missed the kickstarter on this and a couple of people had it at the table i enjoyed it so very much i think this was one of the first games that i championed especially to to uh cool or not i remember telling them like hey you, you have a winner on your hand and they're like really? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I've been <laughs> personally trying to get this game myself and it's just been out of print and it's, it hasn't hit the stores. And I, I, I don't think they knew how to market it. They had their own little universe, which this game was included upon. And it's a real shame because it's a really great game. I was able to get a copy of this. So if you ever get a chance, I'm going to recommend this game as a buy it has a kind of like a slim down version and a kind of like a full table version for it. Either version is completely fine. You're not losing out either way. I don't know. Maybe at least this mechanic will be reused in some other way and some other IP, but uh, definitely a great game. All right. And finally, Anthony, a game that you and I had some fun playing around with. Uh, Steve Jackson had uh, Castellan. Yeah, this is like a, it's basically dots, right? You just It's you basically little, dots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have little castle pieces. You're putting them together. You're trying to enclose spaces so you can put your personal castle in there and that's about it and there's two versions so you have the red and the blue or the green and the yellow you can put them together and play with up to four players it's it's great it's easy it's quick my kids play with the pieces like they're legos and my seven-year-old since he was five we could just play the game straight up very very simple very easy to teach if you have kids if you have family members who are looking something simple and abstract to play i would recommend picking up castellan uh, as a buy it's if you have a chance to play it, definitely check it out. But like we said, it is dots. So it's not don't expect like the most brilliant tactical game in the world. You know, it's dots with cards. <laughs> it's, it's basically what you get. Yeah, I think that you have to be of a certain age to even know what dots was, or basically you had a piece of loose leaf paper that was paper that you used to, have to write notes on. 
you just put all these dots out on a grid and then you draw lines to kind of like connect the dots, but you don't want to leave yourself in a position where somebody else could complete a box because they'd be able to score a point that way. As Anthony said, this is the, I guess, board game or plastic version. It came in two different boxes. There was I think a red and blue and a yellow and green. So you could play up to four players if you had the different boxes. I believe I picked up a version of this when it was on sale at the time. I liked it. I still have it around somewhere, but I have not played with it at that point. So uh, a, a light recommendation as far as a play is concerned, but otherwise I think you can dodge this game and never miss it. All right, Anthony, let's talk about episode four. We talked about War Machine High Command. Yeah. This is another game where I'm like, wait, what? There you go. <laughs> this one fell apart and disappeared real quick. I honestly don't remember what review I gave it at the time. I feel like the first couple of plays I had of this game, I liked it. And then that very quickly went away. And then I forgot about it forever. Uh, it is a deck builder game based on the War Machine universe. You have high command and you have hordes. So the two different sides. And it was all very much like single point combat things where you have a location and you're trying to build up strength and fight each other for that strength based on the cards in your hand. It was fine. It wasn't super well balanced. The artwork was hit or miss. And honestly, some of the experience, it would just drag on a little bit sometimes just trying to get those stupid locations. <laughs> like, yeah, um, I, I at the time, I think I was neutral at this point. I definitely wouldn't play it again. It's a solid dodge for me now. I believe it was a dodge for me as well at the time. I remember the locations being problematic where you could just pick up a location, your opponent could pick up a location, and you fought over one location, or the game wanted you to fight over locations, but why would you just not grab the points that you could grab? So this game was kind of a failure from the start. It just mechanically didn't really work very well, and that was a big problem for me. So this game, is, I think, has completely disappeared. I think it should stay disappeared. So... A high dodge from both of us and just didn't make the cut here. All right, Anthony, let's talk about a game that is more of a classic game. It's been, you know, brought back and revised many, many times. Cosmic Encounter. Yeah, I think this is around the time that we both kind of discovered this game. For me, just being new to the hobby. But it's a it's a funny one. Like, I think we played it several, several times before we even talked about it on the on the podcast here. But it was it was one of those games where it still is where you can play this big, long game. It's almost like a party atmosphere where you're going back and forth. The deck decides who's fighting who or the game can take about 10 minutes and you don't even get to take a turn. And you have to know that's the game you're getting into. And it's not very often I'm in the mood for that. But even now, five and a half years later, and I haven't played this a whole lot recently, I would gladly sit down to play this game because you have so many different races, all the different flavor texts. The core mechanics are just, they're fun, even if they're sometimes a little wonky. And the game never goes too long. So even if it's wonky in the wrong direction, you're not stuck there for three hours. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed this game a lot, although it really kind of swung back and forth radically. There were games in which I never took a turn just because the way the game played out. And there were some games that just never seemed to end. So I don't know. And not to mention there was like these kind of joint victory games. I recommend yeah. this game. I, I think that if you are a board gamer, you owe it to yourself to play Cosmic Encounter. Uh, the asymmetrical races, the alien artwork is fantastic. The way the, the game kind of uses this Destiny deck, tremendous. But it's a more of a game experience in a game because, like I mentioned, I could literally do nothing in a game and it, it just never even got to my turn and the game would be over. So for an experience concerned, high, high recommendations. For, you know, gameplay is concerned, I don't know. You should play it. I think you should you should know it. I think it's it, I think it's something worth playing and experiencing because it's fun. I've thought about picking this up over the years just because I love the asymmetrical artwork and gameplay for the aliens, but I just could never pull the trigger on it. And it deserves to be in the kind of classic board gaming hall of fame for a lot of its different mechanics. But when it comes together, it's just it's just kind of an okay kind of experience. 
All right, Anthony, let's talk about a lighter, I, I guess kind of a kid game, but a game that we enjoyed at our time at Myriad. Hey, that's my fish. Yeah, it's funny. Like I had... I picked this game up in the last couple of years to play with my children. And I now think of it as a children's game. Yep. But then I remember that I used to play it a lot. Yes. <laughs> well before my children could play this game. It's uh, it's very simple. I mean, you have all your penguins out on this board or tableau of different little ice tiles. On the flip side of those tiles is different numbers of fish. You move your guy from point A to point B and you're trying to basically pick up the most fish. But as you do, the tiles disappear and the ice flows start floating away and penguins eventually kind of get poofed out of existence as, as their ice is knocked off of the, the main ice mass. It's kind of a brutal game. If, if you think about like if you know what you're doing, especially you can like box someone out and push them off. But at the same time, it's very, very simple. It's quick to teach. It's easy. It's a small little box. It's got these cute little penguin miniatures. I really like it as a parent to play with my kids it's easy to teach them my son finds it hilarious uh i i don't know if i'd still bring it out to play with other gamers or not though I, i've never even considered throwing it in my game bag so definitely like a dual recommendation here of like if you're a parent buy this if you're not a parent and just playing with gamers give it a try see if it's for you yeah i think of this purely as a kid's game now but i i believe I believe it was part of the, I want to say, year-long board game competition. I think it played a role yeah. <laughs> one particular week. Uh, so uh, it's it's kind of funny. It's 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 a solid play. I mean, it's definitely something to play with the kids. It's, it's fun. It works as a game. It works as a fun and entertaining kind of throwaway thing. Uh, last up is a Z-Man game that became infamous, at least in my gaming circles. This is Parade. This was the little Alice in Wonderland, I guess, lineup of cards that, you know, got some table time at Mirror. Do you remember this one? I only remember playing it with you the one time uh, preceding our review <laughs> and, and the experience that different people had with the game. For me, it was a completely neutral, fine, whatever game. Uh, it was one of those little small box, nicely published card games that Z-Man put out at the time that all had coasters in it for some stupid reason. Yeah, they were doing coasters um, at the time. Yeah, which I still don't understand. Yep. Uh, and, and the game was, mechanically, was, uh, I don't know, it was a whole lot of nothing. I think, I, I for me, it was a dodge, just because those light card games that border on trick-taking are just generally a dodge for me. But it was very much a neutral experience on my end. But not so much for you, No, right? it was not. I think this was <laughs> one of my first kind of, like, total burn down experiences i burned this game and i still to this day burn this game and i'm i'm shocked that people even mention this game for a couple of reasons first off anthony hated chronicle because there was things in the game you just couldn't do on a certain turn this game when you played cards to a certain you know a row you were building this little parade so whatever you had in your hand was forced to go in a specific spot there wasn't any choices concerned like you had a red five, it had to go there. Or green two, it had to go there. And I'm like, I'm not really doing, the game is playing itself. Like I literally could just, you know, have a robot doing this, you know, or just like this becomes this and this becomes that. So I was really upset about that because one of the things was the artwork was very nice. So people like to play it, which made me force play this game, which I did not like to do. And it was not a game play. It was just kind of like, it was rote. And I just, and on top of which they repeated the artwork throughout the game, which was very, very lame. I mean, you can get some mileage if the artwork is good and it's kind of interesting to look at. It was neither here. And yeah, this is one of my earliest burn games and I, I'm sticking to it. So if you have a copy of Parade, uh, burn it and, uh, you know, keep the coasters because, you know, that's pretty much all the games worked. So there you go. <laughs> All right, so there is our early season, episodes one through four, taking a look back at those games. Feel free to check back. BoardGamersAnonymous.com has all of these episodes or iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can jump back, listen to those episodes, see if things have changed, see how we have changed over the years. And we just wanted to give you a sense of if those games are actually still hitting the table and if you should get those games to the table or in the, you know, in the situation of parade, you should avoid those games at all costs. 
Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table. <laughs>